It's my pleasure to introduce our first keynote presenter, Dr. Eric Hanushek. Dr. Hanushek is a senior fellow at the Hoover Institution at Stanford University. He's perhaps best known as a leader in the economic analysis of educational issues, including international student assessment. His research spans such diverse areas as the impact of teacher quality, high stakes accountability, efficiency in school finance, class size reduction, along with his role of cognitive skills in international growth and development. His work was highlighted in the documentary Waiting for Superman. His pioneering analysis measuring teacher quality through growth in student achievement forms the basis for current research into the value added of teachers and schools. He's the chairman of the executive committee for the Texas Schools Project at the University of Texas at Dallas, a research associate of the National Bureau of Educational Research, and a member of the Corette Task Force on K-12 Education. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Eric Hanushek. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Well, Jim and Tim, thank you so much for having me and thank you for coming this morning. Um, this is actually a first for me as we indicate the Twitter feed capabilities. I'm used to looking around a room when I give a talk and seeing a variety of people who roll their eyes back at something I say. But now everybody has the capacity to put up on Twitter, he didn't really say that, did he? <laughs> so I'll, I'll try to be non-controversial so I don't get uh, skewered by the Twitter feed on the side bars here. Um, I'm going to talk about a subject that I think is the future of the United States. Um, and that is our achievement issues, not only the level of our performance, but also the gaps that we see in our achievement. Um, I think somehow we can start these slides. All I get is Twitter that says, uh, Hanushek is ready to start off on the Twitter. Oh, there it is. <laughs> OK, <laughs> got you. <laughs> um, so here are the key questions that I want to uh, look at this morning in a sort of a cursory way and ready to talk about any of them in more detail. The uh, first one is, does achievement matter? And that's the basis for all of this discussion. Secondly, is the United States improving in its achievement? Thirdly, are we catching up to the other countries in the world because we're starting from behind? Um, and fourthly, um, what do we see across the states? How do they compare internationally? Now, many people like to give talks as sort of a murder mystery. And the, I'll dole out the answers as we go along. But instead of that, I, I thought I would just give you the answers. Um, yes, yes, no, yes. OK? The answer is that achievement counts a lot, that the US is improving by some measures, but it is not catching up. And there are huge differences among the states which in some sense gives the challenge, but in other senses gives the hope, because some states are, in fact, improving at a rate that would move us up and forward in the international distribution. Um, I should also point out that just as a test of modern technology, this copies of the slides that are posted and that you might have printed out have these answers wrong in them. So you'll have to check on that. The answers are wrong in your slides that you have, but they're right here. Right. Let me start. Um, I live in Stanford, California, 
which is one jurisdiction away from Mountain View, California, which is the home of Google. And so I'm going to start with the Google Earth view of the world and of education, and then we'll get down to something closer, probably about 20,000 feet by the end of this morning. Um, not, we're not going to land this plane this morning, but maybe we will later on. One of the things that we've had is a long history of calls to improve our achievement. A nation at risk starts as probably the first um, uh, what I'd call clarion call, national call to improve our achievement, talking about the rising tide of mediocrity and that if um, we could think of this as a, in a war scenario, basically. In 1989, uh, George Bush, the elder, as president, called an historic meeting of all the governors in Charlottesville, uh, uh, Virginia, and he, they jointly came together in 1989 and said, we should be first in the world in math and science by the year 2000. This is one of a series of calls and goals that were unmet. President Clinton had goals 2000, which said all Americans should meet competitive world standards and still was on the year 2000. We're going to be up at the top. President Bush, the younger, introduced No Child Left Behind that said by 2013, all children in the United States would be proficient. Um, I think we have a little bit more. We have 11 more months here to, to make that happen. Um, and in uh, the 2011 State of the Union address by President Obama, he basically emphasized the need to out-educate other people in the world. The place where I'd put this is according to my co colleague, um, Condi Rice. My colleague, Condi Rice, with Joel Klein, chaired a commission that reported last year that basically said, this is a security issue. It is a security issue to get our achievement up because it is going to affect the character and the level of our economy and how we compete with other countries in the world. This, I believe, is true. I, I don't think it's hyperbole. And the way I'm going to show you this is uh, let's go to the full uh, Google Earth view of the world here. Um, well, I, I guess I have one other slide. Um, here's, the, here's my summary, that there is nothing that is um, more important because long-run growth of the U.S. economy is what determines our economic well-being and our economic capacity. Long-run economic growth depends upon human capital. In the long run, that's all that counts, is the skills of the people of the U.S. Human capital depends upon how we invest in our youth, um, and it's going to come back to haunt us if we don't do a better job. And then finally, with all of the discussions about the distribution of income and fairness, that's again a story of human capital. The only way we're going to solve the fairness problem is not through higher marginal tax rates on the rich, but in fact by improving the human capital of all of our citizens. I think that this almost works sometimes. There it is. OK, now I have the, here's, here's Google Earth. Um, this is a, a fairly complicated graph that has a simple story in it. What this does is, along the horizontal axis, measure the years of schooling of different countries in the world. Each uh, set of characters up here is, identifies an individual country. So we have Taiwan and Singapore, we have um, uh, Venezuela, we have 
all uh, the countries. We have France in the middle. Somewhere in the middle, you'll find the US. I can't find them right now. And on the vertical axis is growth rates uh, for the nations. These are long-run growth rates. This is the growth in per capita GDP over the period 1960 to 2000. Now, there's one thing I have to explain to you. Everything says conditional years of school and conditional growth. What this is is recognizing one simple fact other than human capital. And that is countries that start behind find it easier to grow. Why? Because all you have to do is copy what everybody else does. You don't have to invent anything new. So if you start ahead, the only way you can grow is by inventing new things. So all of this in the background is allowing for where countries were in 1960. But after that, it says years of schooling and growth rates are important. Now, for non-economists, uh, you get numbers like the difference between 1%, 2%, 3% growth, and you think, well, that's kind of small. You know, one, what's 1% 1 mean? Well, it turns out that 1% is a huge number. The reason the US is the richest country in the world today is that over the last 100-year period, we've had a slightly higher growth rate than everybody else in the world. We started with a lot of resources, but we also had a slightly higher growth rate. And it adds up, and I'll show you how it adds up in terms of achievement in a minute. Now, this is the picture that is normally given. And this is the picture that says, let us, in, um, in our schooling, make sure that everybody graduates from high school. Let's get more people college ready and through college and so forth. Uh, this is also the picture that allows the World Bank to say that we should have education for all. Everybody in the world should get up to an eighth grade education. And I'm here to tell you that this picture is wrong. This is not the right picture. The right picture is this one, which instead of years of schooling, it has test scores on the horizontal axis. And it still has growth rates on the vertical axis. Now, what you notice is two things here. One is. There is this positive relationship between test scores and growth rates. And all of the countries that we picture on here are pretty closely packed to this line. In fact, for the technical people, 85% of the variation in growth rates across the world are explained by differences in test scores. Now, in this picture, we can now see the US a little bit better. I'm sorry that I can't get out to that picture. But the US is right in the middle above the line. We're above the line because we've had some historic advantages in terms of our economy. We cannot expect to be above the line in the future. Now, let me come back to show you the, to reinforce that the previous picture was wrong. Here is the picture I showed you of years of schooling and growth rates uh, with only adjusting for where countries were in 1960. Here's the picture that you get for years of schooling and growth rates if you, in fact, allow for the difference in achievement of nations. It's a perfectly flat line. There is no relationship between years of schooling across countries and growth rates after we allow for what people know. What people know is the important thing that adds to the skills that affect long-run growth. Now, what I want to do is talk a little bit about uh, the impact of achievement differences. Let me talk about the importance to the United States of achievement um, in by first comparing us to some of the countries that we normally think of, of as sort of competitors. But they're not competitors if you know the test score uh, literature, the international test scores very well. Because Germany systematically is ahead of us uh, in technical terms, a quarter of a standard deviation or 25 uh, PISA points on the scale. Canada 
our northern neighbor that looks kind of like us, right? And there are probably some Canadians in here. But Canada uh, significantly outperforms our students on international math and science tests. And then you get to the top where everybody has uh, Finland envy because Finland has historically been at the top. I'm going to give you some sense of what it would mean to the US if, in fact, we could get up to the level of these countries. And then I'm also going to talk about what I've labeled education for all. It's not that. It's no child left behind. What would happen if we actually accomplished the George Bush goals of having proficient students? So let me explain what I'm going to do here uh, before I give you the answers. Um, what I'm going to do is say the historic relationship between achievement and growth continues into the future. Let's just assume that history tells us something about what will happen. I'm going to take and assume that somehow over the next 20 years, perhaps on the basis of what you people do over the next two days, but somehow over the next 20 years, we can get to the level of Germany or Canada or um, Finland in terms of achievement. And then I'm going to say, well, what's the impact going to be on the US economy? Well, we know tomorrow the impact is zero, right? I mean, even if we started improving our schools, the kids aren't in the labor force, and so it has no impact. It takes a long time. It takes 20 years to get them up to higher levels. And then you have to wait till they're out in the labor force before it really counts, because it's skills in the labor force that are going to determine the economic value of these. So what I'm going to do is assume that people filter into the labor force with higher skills. And after 20 years, we're getting this higher skilled group in that takes a while to, to dominate the labor force. And then I'm just going to solve, I'm going to say, if history holds, if the growth rate patterns that we've seen in the past hold for the next 80 years, and 80 years is chosen just because that's the lifespan of somebody born today, is roughly 80 years from now. So over the lifetime of somebody born today, what is the sum of the additions to GDP that you would get from these achievement gains? Now, some of us really aren't all that concerned directly by the 2090 GDP. We're not going to be here. Okay, so what I'm going to do is discount this all back to today in terms of today. I'm going to give less weight to 2090. I don't care so much about 2090. And I'm going to wait more just to calculate a present value of this. And here's, here's the numbers that you get. Being Germany, which is getting 25 points more on PISA tests, um, is, has a present value of $44 trillion. We have a $16 trillion economy today. So we're talking about almost three times the value of our entire GDP in terms of the present value. They're in comparable units. They're in today's dollars. Comparable value of the present value of being Germany over the next 20 years. It's like 6% higher GDP each and every year for the next 80 years. Or if you put it in terms of workers, it's like every worker for the next 80 years will have a 12% higher paycheck. You all have seen how Washington, D.C. is tied in knots about the fiscal problems and the fiscal cliff. The whole question that is being asked in Washington is, should we solve this problem by increasing our revenues, or should we solve this problem by cutting our spending, or some combination of that? 
the entire problem goes away, goes away if we could, in fact, get achievement to the level of Germany in the next 20 years, at least according to the historical relationships of the economy to the skills of the population. In other words, we wouldn't have to have this gnashing of teeth in, in Washington and concern about the fiscal cliff and the debt limit and all of that business. Because the, the increases in GDP actually quite handily match where the fiscal problems of the US are. The fiscal problems are longer run problems that have to do with Medicare spending a little bit on Social Security, lots on Medicare and some other things. And that the time pattern of our problems there is matched by improving our schools. Now you get, um, none of these numbers make any sense, right? As we go across these columns, you get numbers that are just out of sight. If we could be Canada, we're talking about something in excess of $80 trillion in present value. I mean, Canada looks like us, it's just a little colder, right? I mean, it, um, not quite as good a skiing in most of Canada as in Colorado, but pretty good skiing. If we could beat Finland, we're talking about something on the order of $112 trillion present value, or something like 16% higher GDP each and every year over the next um, 80 years. It matters. It matters and it matters a lot. And this is going to determine the future of the US economy and the well-being of our kids and grandkids. Um, and then at the, at the far right-hand column, I have what would happen if we were just, just made NCLB? I mean, not this year, not the 2013 title of, of NCLB, but if we made it in 2022 or 2023. Um, oh, that's, that's, that's actually right. If we made, the calculations are if we made it in 2033, not 2013, 20 years from now. Then we're still talking about something that is on the order of, um, what is that, six times, uh, five and a half times our current GDP in terms of the present value. These are big things. They matter. How do we compare? Why well, I've been giving you some of these comparisons. Um, what I want to do is put the comparisons not in terms of our rankings. Our, in our rankings, by the way, in terms of math and science on the PISA test, which are the um, developed countries test of the OECD, uh, all the developed countries, um, we're sort of in the middle. In terms of high achieving kids, in terms of like advanced math and science, we're something over 30th position in terms of the proportion of kids that we prepare with advanced math and science. If you think of those as the future engineers and scientists of the country that are gonna help with innovation, um, we're not doing so well. In terms of um, our gains, we actually have been making improvements. If you, this is largely from the National Assessment of Educational Progress, or NAEP. We've been improving at the eighth grade level, uh, which is where the PISA tests are essentially set, um, at 1.6% uh, of a standard deviation. I mean, it's small, but but steady over the last 20 years um, so that uh, over the 14 years that we have actually numbers, it's almost a quarter of a standard deviation. Okay, so that's pretty good. There should be an asterisk beside this though. The asterisk beside this should be that that's at the eighth grade level. If I look at the 12th grade level in our NAEP scores, they're flat for the last 40 years. 
there is no improvement. So that the gains that we have made at the eighth grade level have not translated into gains at people ready to go to college or into the labor market. So there is an asterisk beside this. It also turns out that this is the median of international performance over time. Um, 24 countries uh, by our ranking ability to match the US to international do better. 24 countries do worse. We're right in the middle. So we've had improvements, but we're not moving ahead of everybody. Everybody else is also improving at a similar pace is what this is, or there's a distribution around it. Um, so here's a graph of gains in comparison of the US to international. The US is the green in the second row is the green level, which is right in the middle of everybody else. And you see that um, you know, there are some less developed countries, Latvia, Chile, uh, Brazil, um, Portugal, I guess, is less developed at this point, um, Hong Kong, Germany, Poland, that are doing noticeably better in terms of improvement. So for example, when I did the calculations before, I said if we could get the Germany, I meant Germany's level today. Germany is actually improving over time, so we wouldn't actually catch Germany according to those calculations. And then we get down to, well, if we get the Hungary um, and Iran, then you get to the US, and we're doing considerably better than some of the other countries that are kind of funny. Sweden, uh, Bulgaria, uh, Thailand have not been doing very well. But we're right in the middle. Now, there are two ways to look at this. One way is, well, we're not doing too well. We're, we're improving a little bit, but not gaining. The other way to look at this is that there is some hope as I look across the US. Um, here's the, the challenge. Here's some of the larger growing countries. This is in percent of a standard deviation each year. Remember I said that on NAEP, on average, we were growing at 1.6% of a standard deviation every year. Here are countries like Germany that's at 3.8% or Brazil at 4%. And even the UK is at 2.8%. Um, so they're ahead of us. But there's a big difference across the US. Now I've got a map of the US. You can find your own state, hopefully. Um, that's, a, that's a level one PISA geography question. Can you find your own state on this? Um, if you find your own state, what you see is that the bright colors, the, the solid bright green here, Florida, Louisiana, Massachusetts, those are the countries that are in the top 10 of performance of improvement uh, across the US. And I'll, identify them in a little bit more. As the country, as the colors get less bright, like Texas and California, um, the, uh, they're in the 11th to 20th. Colorado is, is close. Um, and then as you get lighter, this swath down the middle of the country, um, you get to countries that are um, 31st or below. This is, a, by the way, the black, the black are people that didn't take the NAEP test early in the period in the 1990s, so I don't have them on here. So if you're, if you're a black state, you get a bad name only because you were afraid to take the test in 1992 where everybody else is taking it. Um, everybody does take it now. Um, who, who are the winners? Well, the winners are Maryland, Florida, Delaware, and Massachusetts is pretty close. But the reason for some optimism is that these states have shown that they are, in fact, capable of getting to the higher growth rate that we see internationally. They are the countries that are ahead of 
the UK, and coming in a little bit behind Germany, but they're still up in the faster growing places. Um, sorry, Jason. Uh, this is your slide. Uh, Jason Glass is here. Um, this is all before Jason Glass took over in Iowa. But here's who's gained the least. This is this swath down the middle of the country um, from Nebraska to Iowa. And I can also show you some of the larger states. So if we look at the larger states, New Jersey has, has done pretty well. Um, in the the largest states of California, New York, um, and Texas, we see that they're right in the middle. These are in the middle because there's 41 states that we have uh, information on over this entire period from 1992. And so our biggest states are doing average. Average is not very good on an international comparison. Um, Colorado, the state where we are right now, is right at the middle of this. Um, these are the states that if they could emulate Maryland, Florida, Delaware, Massachusetts, with the students that they have, we could become competitive internationally of the way we're, that I was talking about before. So. Um, let's, let's come back and talk a little bit about where the gains are in the, across the states. This is a plot that along the horizontal axis gives us essentially gains in NAEP performance at the top end. How many are getting to be at least proficient or advanced on the NAEP? And the vertical axis is uh, reductions in those that are below basic. In other words, the, the real NCLB portion of this. It's been argued in a variety of places that NCLB has completely skewed all of education to focus entirely on the bottom end. And it has left the top end out of the picture. But what this says is that states that do well in terms of the bottom end also do well at the top. States that do poorly at the bottom end do poorly at the top. And so there's this very direct relationship that if you improve your schools, um, what we've seen over the last 15 years is that schools improve across the spectrum or they don't improve across the spectrum. So that it's not NCLB entirely skewing us uh, away from this. The other picture that I would put up along with this is, well, what's, what's behind this? So this is um, the standard picture that says, well, if we're going to do this, we've got to invest in our schools. That means spending more money. And among other things, how can we do that today? Because there are such fiscal pressures on all of our states. Well, what this has is along the horizontal axis is the increase in per capita expenditures in real terms, all in uh, 2009 dollars, versus the gains in achievement that states have made. So you see, for example, that Florida has essentially spent nothing in addition on their schools in real terms, but they've gotten very high gains. Massachusetts has spent a fair amount, and it's also got high gains. Um, Maine has spent a lot of money, and it's lost ground. Um, and you see everybody's scattered around. You know, Wyoming, the first of our uh, mineral-rich uh, states, spent anything that any of the schools wanted and got mediocre performance out of it. So the story here that I want to put over the top is that it's not so much how much is being spent, but it's how it's being spent. And that's the story that comes through time and time again. I know that 
lots of people in this room don't want to hear that story mentioned because it's always easier to work with more money. But that's not what's uh, really going on here. Now, I haven't um, gone in, I'm not going into in great detail what is it that counts. I would make just a couple of calm, uh, simple statements just to provoke the audience or provoke you. Um, in my opinion, the only thing that matters in schools is the quality of the teachers. Nothing matters beyond that. So all of the discussion about um, common core and should we get higher standards and so on, I find is a complete distraction compared to getting higher quality teachers. It's how materials are presented, not the standards that you hope that they're getting to. I'm willing to talk about that. Um, but that also leads to why, what's behind this picture. What's behind this picture is the fact that over long periods of time, we have found that there is no relationship between teacher salaries and teacher effectiveness. No relationship. Since teacher salaries are the largest part of our spending on schools, if salaries are unrelated to performance, you can see how some people do well without spending any additional money. Some people do poorly spending a lot more money. And there's a whole range of things because it is not set by how much is spent, but it's how it's focused. And to me, how it's focused means what is the quality of the teaching force. Um, there are some other calculations that I have done in terms of teaching that I'll just mention because they're relevant here. Over the last 20 or 25 years, we've found a lot of evidence about the range of teacher effectiveness that we see within all of our schools. And it exists in almost every school, this range of effectiveness. If you do the following mental experiment, that is, if you line up all of the teachers in the US in terms of quality, from the least effective to the most effective, and do a mental experiment that says, let's take the bottom one or two or three percent of the teachers and replace them with an average teacher. Not a superstar, just an average teacher. What happens to achievement in the US if we can do something like that? And what you see when you do this is that if we could replace five to eight percent, I'm giving you a range because there is some uncertainty about the distribution of teacher effectiveness, but if we could replace five to eight percent of our teachers that are the least effective with an average teacher, we could be Canada, according to this, um, what we know about the range of teacher effectiveness. And being Canada was worth $80 trillion. So that's um, the, the, what I see as the challenge. Now that's a, a, a sort of perhaps specific view that other people will dis disagree with, but that's where I think the challenge is. Now the final thing that I should say on this trends and test scores and so forth, when, when you compare across countries achievement with economic growth, there's always this question that is it really achievement or is it something else about these countries that matters? Is it some other factor like the quality of the economic institutions? Um, is it the culture and so forth? So what this graph does is simply take trends in the test scores because we can, we've been taking international tests actually since the mid 1960s. If we take the trends in test scores that we see across countries and plot them against the trend in the growth rate of countries, 
So growth rates tend to move slightly up, slightly down. What we see is that there's a direct relationship between countries that have managed to find a way to improve their achievement are also countries where their economic outcomes are tending to improve. Here are the key questions. Does achievement matter? Is the US improving? Are we catching up? And are there important differences across states? Yes, yes, no, yes. That's, that's the answers that we have. Now, the picture that I'll leave you with is one that my summary of what I see of US education policy that starts with the 1983 Nation at Risk report and goes through to today, where every, every day there's a new report out, it goes something like this. First, we have to recognize the value of education. And it all starts with that, uh, from Nation at Risk to every other report. From that, once we see the value of education, we see that there's a need for improvement. Once we see a need for improvement, we set about setting challenging goals. Um, and then what happens? Then we ar arrive back at failure, which allows us to then start back at the beginning of recognizing achievement. We have to break this cycle because this is the future of the United States. Now, it's not that we're in competition with all these other countries. Every country in the world can, in fact, grow by improving their performance. That's what the data suggests to me. Um, and so it, it's not zero sum that if we grow, somebody else can't grow, or if China grows, we can't grow. I don't think it's that. But what it is, is that we are in a position today of being the international leader, not only in technology and, and industry, but in um, sort of power and military uh, uh, ability and capacity. And this will be challenged if all the other countries of the world, in fact, develop at the rates that are suggested by their performance, and we don't. That's why I come back to Condi Rice's statement that this is the future of the US. And it, it's a national defense issue. It's an issue about the well-being of our uh, society. And I'll stop at that point. <laughs>